Good evening, parents and seniors. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. My name is Taisha McEwen. I am a college and career readiness counselor here at High Tide. Tonight is our annual senior financial aid night. Tonight we have Ms. Loriana from John Carroll University. She's gonna go over the updated FAFSA for you guys tonight. And then after her, I have a really quick scholarship PowerPoint to show you guys about um, scholarships. So thank you guys so much for coming tonight. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask either of us um, in the back. We have Mr. Bob Swagger, he's the director of College and Readiness. We also have Ms. Menifee, who is also a um, counselor here at XI. So again, thank you so much for coming. Hi, as she stated, my name is Inez Lariano, um, and I am the Associate Director of Student Financial Services for John Carroll University. Um, <coughs> just curious to know, how many have you completed a FAFSA already, either for a sibling of your student or for yourself? Okay, so many of you are going to see a slight change, maybe a little more slight, maybe a little more than slight, um, with the upcoming FAFSA. Um, so I will try to go through some of the things in regards to what it was before, just so that you guys are aware of some of the things that might have changed. So with the agenda, we're gonna go over the basic understanding of the process, the application process and timeline. We'll go over the FAFSA, special circumstance, and some tips for success. So although parents have the primary responsibility for paying for their students' college, the student is also expected to assist with the cost, and that is with the financial aid. So financial aid, a lot of people think that financial aid is just considered free money, and that's not always the case. So financial aid is anything that is utilized to help pay for your student's tuition. What we use in order to determine eligibility is the cost of attendance minus the SAI, which totals financial need, which helps us determine what your student may be eligible for. Now, for those of you that recall, we used to use the word, or the acronym EFC, all right, Expected Family Contribution. That has now changed to SAI which is your student aid index. So that is the transition that you will see from those that have looked at that before as an EFC and now as a SAI. Cost of attendance is gonna include both direct and indirect expenses. And the biggest difference between the two is that one is actually billed on your student's account. So you will see on your student's account, you will see tuition, fees, room and board. The things that you may not see on the account is going to be books, transportation, personal expenses. But all of this is taken into consideration for each institution that your student is looking for or looking at to determine what that cost of attendance is. So this can be different at each school that your student is looking at. Okay. Now the student aid index, again, what used to be the EFC, is calculated using data from the FAFSA. Okay, so that's where that is determined. It stays the same regardless of college. Okay, so regardless of the student's cost of attendance at this institution or this institution, the SAI will remain the same for each school. They look at two components, which includes your parent information and then your student information and is used at most institu institutions as an indication of federal and state eligibility. So the way that that SAI is calculated, and as I stated, that is directly from the information that is put on the FAFSA, okay? We're gonna look at the student and parent income from prior, prior year. So for those that are completing the FAFSA, when it comes up, you are using 2022 taxes. Okay. We'll look at taxes paid, family size, assets, business farm value, child support received, and then the value of the 529 plan for the applicant only. 
that is one of the changes as well that's to the FAFSA because before you had to put the 529 for all of the of your kids in the household. So now it is just the student. Financial aid is normally put in two separate categories and that is need-based and non-need-based. So you may hear me refer to something as need-based or non-need-based. Um, so I will give you some examples of what that might be. The types of financial aid that your student is going to be looking at is both gift aid and self-help aid. And the gift aid is going to include any free money that your student is receiving. So I always tell the student, anything with the word grant and scholarship is free money. It's money that you do not have to repay. And then we have the self-help aid, which is loans, which has to be repaid. And then work study, which is your student's ability to get a job on campus and earn a paycheck. Okay, now with work study, normally it is not something that's deducted from the tuition. It's a situation where your student is getting paid just like any other position, and they can save that up to use that for what's needed to help pay for tuition or any necessities they need. The sources of financial aid who's giving the aid is going to be federal, there's state grants, college and universities private sources, and then employers. The federal student aid programs, which is coming directly from the federal government, which requires the FAFSA, is going to be the federal Pell Grant. We have the SEOG. We have TEACH Grant that some institutions offer. The federal work study, direct loans, and then a parent plus loan. Those are all considered federal aid in which the FAFSA has to be completed on a yearly basis. The federal student loans that your student qualifies for is going to be divided or may not be divided into two categories, which is going to be the subsidized loan and the unsubsidized loan. The subsidized loan is specifically a need-based loan meaning that based on that calculation that I was showing you from the beginning, if, that is, if there is no need, then your student is just going to qualify for the unsubsidized loan. These loans are something that your student is eligible to take out or to borrow just based on the fact that they are a student. Okay? The only people that would not qualify for a loan, as long as you've completed the FAFSA, would be those that maybe went to college already and might be in default, meaning you didn't pay on that student loan. So anybody that went to college and trying to go back, if you weren't paying on your student loan, you can be in a default status to where you'd have to clear that up before being eligible for the loan. Now this is something that is specifically in your student's name. Okay. And the repayment is usually a 10-year period. But at the moment or the time that they are required to pay it back, which is going to be six months after they've graduated or left school, they will be able to pick the payment plan in which they want to utilize in order to pay these loans. The interest rate on these loans, just so that you're aware for this year that we are in right now for 23-24 is currently at a 5.5, so that can change on a yearly basis, okay? But that is fixed at that rate for that year. The difference between the subsidized and the unsubsidized loan is that the subsidized loan would not accrue any interest while you're in school, meaning that there's no interest that's adding on that subsidized loan. Okay? So sometimes people say, well, I have a 529, but I only have this specific amount. I tell them, figure out how much they have in the 529, divide it into four years, and it could be beneficial for your student to still take out that subsidized loan because you don't want to struggle at the end. And if you had the opportunity to take the subsidized loan the whole time while your student was in college, then you may not fall short. So just basically do the math in regards to how that um, impacts your, your aid. Sorry, what's a 529? Did I miss that? I'm sorry, I should specify. 529 is a, saving, a savings plan that basically some people have saved up while their student was in school. 
Okay. And then the unsubsidized loan accrues interest immediately. So that one is at a 5.5. The interest will accrue, meaning it's adding on, but you're still not required to make payments on either of these till six months after graduation or leaving school. The way that the loans work is it's based off of your status. So as a freshman, your student can borrow up to $5,500 in the loan. So depending on what your SAI or your, your, your need is, is going to determine what it's divided up to. So your student qualifies for $5,500, but that calculation is going to determine how much of sub in comparison to un unsub that student will receive. So if the calculation shows that you only have 2,000 in need, they will allow you to get 2,000 in the um, subsidized amount, but then they will go ahead and add 1,500 to that 2,000. So you'll be able to get 3,500 in the unsub and when I say 15 or 2,000 in the subsidized, still totaling the 5,500. I don't know if that made sense. Okay, so it depends. But your student's maximum loan eligibility is going to be 5,500 as a freshman. As their status moves up to sophomore, it's gonna be 6,500. And then as a junior and senior, it's going to be 7,500. Another option for our families is a parent plus loan, okay? So the other loans that I spoke about with the subsidized and unsubsidized is specifically in your student's name, okay? There is a parent plus loan which would fall under the parent's name, which is based on the parent's credit, okay? So that's the main difference. With the subsidized, unsubsidized loans that your student can borrow, they're not looking at credit. With the Parent PLUS loan, they're going to run a credit check to determine eligibility. The good thing about the Parent PLUS loan is you could borrow up to the cost of attendance. So you can cover the amount that's due through that Parent PLUS loan if you qualify. Now the interest rate is a little bit higher on this one, which this year is at an 8.05. They do charge a 4% origination fee. Um, so, you have to be careful with that. If you do not qualify, there are some cases where I've told families that they've told me that they don't qualify to go ahead and apply for it because what that allows for is for your student to borrow an additional 4000 for the year in the unsubsidized loan. Okay? So at any point you're a little bit short, but you're saying, okay, no, my credit, or I filed bankruptcy, I won't qualify, whatever the case may be, still apply for it so that your student will qualify for that additional 4000 in that unsubsidized loan so you could sort of make that payment so you can be able to afford it. Now, state aid specifically, here in Ohio, we offer the OCOG. So that is a state grant that you may qualify for depending on the results of the FAFSA. Okay, so in regards to the state grant, it is based off of the FAFSA results, which is based off that SAI. Okay, so currently for those students that had an EFC of 3750, 3750 would have qualified for the state grant. Okay, I'm making the assumption everybody lives in Ohio. Could you remind us what the EFC is? The EFC was what was utilized in 23-24 and prior as that calculation being replaced by that SAI. So it was expected family contribution. So basically, that's what allows us to determine your eligibility. College and universities may offer aid as well, so scholarships and grants as well. So you need to be very specific in looking at your specific college that you're interested in and what is being offered. What do they require? Do they require a FAFSA to get the additional grants? Do they require, what specifically do they require? 
So you want to make sure for each college your student is looking online and making a list of deadlines and things that are needed for that specific school. Private sources could be scholarships from outside entities, so uh, churches. Um, it could be from charitable organizations. It could be businesses. I know some parents had the ability to either borrow or receive um, aid from the, the, their employer. So look at what's out there in regards to that as well. Um, but definitely want to not avoid the outside sources. You want to look at Fast Web is one of the um, more um, popular sites to determine outside scholarships. Have your student look at that and continuously look at that. Um, don't give up after the freshman year. They may not qualify for it freshman year, but there might be scholarships out there that look at whether or not a junior or senior or whatever the case may be um, in order to um, award you additional aid or scholarships. So we're going to run into the application process. So again, I do, I want to stress the importance of looking at the specific schools that your student is interested in. They can be different, the requirements, the dates things are due can be different for each school that your student is looking for. So you want to make sure that you are looking online and seeing when those deadlines are. So some colleges have institutional applications. So there can be different scholarships that are out there that require an additional scholarship. Okay, you won't know that unless you look on, on their website or talk to their admissions person. We all know about the FAFSA in order to determine federal eligibility. Some schools, like for some of our aid, the grants, we also look at the FAFSA as well. And again, I want to make it clear that this is usually something that has to be completed every year. Okay, so don't forget to complete it yearly. And then some schools that your student may be looking at, may be looking at the CSS profile. So the, they switched the name with that. So College Scholarship Service, so the CSS profile, places like CASE, for instance, requires the CSS profile. And what that is, it's just a deeper dive into basically your household, into your finances, and things such as that, that helps them determine any eligibility that you may have in regards to their aid. Okay, so again, make sure you look at your, the school that your student is interested to determine eligibility. We are going to specifically focus on the FAFSA for the next few slides. Um, anything in regards to questions regarding the CSS profile or things like that, I would definitely call the institution that requires it. Institutional applications, you definitely want to call the institution as well to get clarification on any type of process. All right. But for the FAFSA, the first step that you guys are going to need to do is create an FSA ID, okay? This is going to be your electronic signature all the way through your career in school, whether it's undergrad, grad, okay? The one thing that has changed in regards to the FSA ID, before it was the student, and one parent that needed to complete the FSA ID. <coughs> they have changed that to say that anybody within that household, and we'll go over that in detail, will need an FSA ID. So if mom and dad are still in the same household with the student, it'd be the student, mom and dad. If mom is remarried, it's gonna be the student, mom, and husband, and so forth. Okay, everyone will require an FSA ID. So some of you, if you have older siblings, one of your parents may already have an FSA ID. All right, so now the other one needs to get it as well. Okay. When creating your FSA ID, you wanna make sure that you are utilizing an email that you can access at all times. So if your Cleveland Heights email is going to go away after you graduate, you do not want to use that email. 
because that is the way you are going to access it if you forget your password. So if you forget your password, you're gonna go and utilize more than likely your email so that you can reset it. So you wanna make sure you have access to that email. So do not use your Cleveland Heights email. Um, this FSA ID will also be utilized for things like applying. So if, you're if your student's taking out a student loan, they're going to need it for their entrance counseling and master promissory note that's going to be required. If your parent's applying for a parent plus loan, it's going to be utilized for that as well. So this is basically your signature for the federal site. So the FSA ID for students and parents need to be obtained at least three days prior to completing the FAFSA. Okay, so our hopes is that the FAFSA is going to be available by the end of December, middle of December. So my suggestion is while your, your, your student is home with you for break, for Thanksgiving break, to go ahead and create that FSA ID so it's active because what this does is it makes a match with your social security, your birthday, your name, and it's going to say whether or not that FSA ID is going to work. If there's an issue with any of that, it's not going to be able to make a match and you're going to have to figure out a way what went wrong, what happened, what number was wrong. Other preparation in regards to completing the FAFSA is going to be your social security number for the student. Okay. Sorry. So, do the student and parents need separate FSA IDs? Yes, if separate the, FSA IDs, which require separate emails. Is the parent one just for the parent plus loan? No, because for the FAFSA, if your student is dependent, you are going to be on the FAFSA as well. So you need it as well to sign it at the end. No, no, just parents and, siblings. and no siblings, okay. just the student and the parents. So the main household supporters, the people that are supporting. So it'd be the parents and the student. Yes. So if you have guardianship over a child, then it's the two parents that have the, or the one parent that has the guardianship over the child, or both parents in the household. So the guardianship is going to work a little bit different. I'm glad I asked that question. Okay. okay. Um, guardianship, and depending on how you complete the FAFSA, is going to determine whether or not any parent would have to be on there. Okay. So adoption is going to be a little bit different. Adoption, they're considered parent. The guardian is something else. And we could talk after. Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. All right. You're going to need 22 tax returns. Now, I say that but you shouldn't really need it, and I'll explain here in a moment. Uh, you want to know your assets and investments, any business or farm value, child support received, and just want to make sure that each separate person has um, separate email and you have correct date of birth and social security number. I know that sounds silly, but just make sure that the information is correct because once you mess that up, creating your FSA ID, it, it can take forever to correct it. So in order to complete the FAFSA, you are going to go to the, um, it says FAFSA.gov. It's either FAFSA.gov or StudentAid.gov, which is the more common one that's utilized. The StudentAid.gov, if you put FAFSA.gov, it's going to direct you to StudentAid.gov. Okay? But the StudentAid.gov site is the one where you're going to complete everything. As I stated, parent plus loan. If your student is taking a loan, entrance counseling and master promissory note. It's going to have all that information. Okay. It's supposed to come out December. So um, we don't know how soon in December, um, but it should come by the end of December. What's going to happen is after this year, after we go through this new FAFSA, it should be available then in October. Okay, that's what we switched it to a few years ago was October. They switched it back to December this time because of all the changes they were making to the FAFSA. Okay. You want to confirm with individual college for preferred deadline. Again, I know I keep on um, repeating myself, but it's really important for you guys to know the deadlines for each school. All right. 
And then, um, yep, it creates the SAI. So this is what you are going to see when you log in, and you have two <coughs> options. You could either go in as the student or as the parent. Now I say when you can go in as either, obviously you need the credentials to get in. <laughs> My suggestion is to have your student with you. Mm -hmm. And if you have a couple laptops, have your laptops ready. Okay, because the changes that they have made requires one person to fill it out first, then that other person then gets an email, verify through the email, enter the FAFSA back in as a parent, if that's the way you're going. So if the student goes in, completes their information, they're going to have to put on there the parents that should be included. The parent is then going to get an email once the student has submitted and completed their part, and then the student is going to access it, or the parent's gonna access it through that email. This is the biggest change, okay? I'm not necessarily sure why it was done. I don't know if people were filling out stuff for people and, and they needed more security, but this is the way that it's done now. So we're suggesting if you have a couple laptops, or even if you don't, you can shut down the one laptop, log back into your email, and then access it through there. But it would be beneficial for everybody that's in the household that needs to be in the FAFSA, so parents and student, to be to complete this at one time. Okay. So again, the contributors to the FAFSA, parents and spouses. Now the reason why you need both contributors which they're calling parents contributors um, on here is because your information is going to link directly from the IRS so basically what we're calling it now they used to call it data retrieval I'm only telling you the past just in case there's some of you here that remember the the verbiage that we used before so data retrieval is now considered the Future Act Direct Data Exchange. And what that is, it allows FAFSA <coughs> to go ahead and link to the IRS, pulling your information directly to the FAFSA. Okay? And the reason why both people are required to have a um, FSA ID is because they have to give consent okay so if you did married filing joints the FAFSA wants to know that both parents have consented for their information to be put on their taxes to be entered into the FAFSA okay um, IRS transfers information to populate FAFSA income questions for most tax filers and it eliminates the manual entry of tax and income information. So if it works, it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we will see. The difference, the difference of last year and this year is if you were married filing joint, you could not use the data retrieval. So now they're saying they've corrected some things and all this stuff should be able to go through. Yes. Does this mean it's also going to eliminate the audits that are happening right before students go to school where you have to resubmit stuff when your financial, the financial director from your institution calls you and says you have 15 days to get this paperwork in? So you're talking about verification. And you know what? That is one thing that has not been brought up, but what it does, it eliminates the families from having to give us their tax returns because it was directly linked. So what was happening is anybody that was able to use this before, if they were selected for verification, it would just need the form and we require W-2s. So it was as simple as that. Um, so I don't know, they haven't said if it's gonna eliminate verification or not. We're hoping, maybe. Will it auto-populate for, for two seniors? that are doing this will just auto populate for both kids yes it should populate on its own okay yep it should 
Okay, so I jumped to FAFSA errors first before going over some of the questions that would be on the FAFSA, just so that you guys can catch this prior to going on to the FAFSA, which is Social Security numbers, I, I know I've said it like 10 times, okay? Divorce, remarried, parental information, okay? It's confusion with these situations in regards to who to use. Okay. So a big mistake that families use is utilizing biological parents when they're not in the same household. Right. So if the student's biological parents are separated, divorced, whatever the situation, in separate households, you need to determine who is supporting that child at least 51%. Who is supporting that child more? So if that student is supported by that child more by dad, and dad is remarried, then dad and wife have to go on the FAFSA. Okay? All right. Income earned by parents and step parents. So that means if you're putting that step parent on the FAFSA, their income counts as well. Okay? And I know a lot of people are not happy with that concept, but the way that the FAFSA is looking at it is that's somebody that's helping support that household. And then um, real estate and investments. So a lot of people, their biggest asset is their home. Okay, that is not something that you are going to include on the FAFSA. If you have rental property, that would be a little bit different. If you have rental property, you need to see the worth of the home and how much you owe and subtract the two and put that as an S asset. Yes. So your average person, if they own a home and they have a mortgage, FAFSA won't consider that an asset? Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. <laughs> right. It's most of our biggest assets. I mean, you know. But they'll take it if they, if they want it. Right. If you default, they'll take it. Okay. So some of the information that's going on the FAFSA is going to be identity and contact information, consent for the transfer, marital status, college plans, and personal unusual circumstances. Now, in regards to your student's information, it's going to depend on how they answer the questions to determine whether or not they're considered dependent or independent. Okay? So in a situation where a student may answer yes to yes, they were in legal guardianship, it would be a situation where they're answering yes and that would make them independent. If a student said they were married, it would make them independent, but they'd have to put their husband's information on there too, as far as income. <coughs> For college plans, you can now list up to 20 schools. 20. So I hope your student has narrowed it down a little bit less than 20. Oh, for sake. And then we use, we look at personal and unusual circumstances. So in some cases, um, it's going to ask, are you able to provide parental information? If the answer is no, then there's going to be an additional step. And I believe that's a slide in the future. So again, the student dependency status is going to determine on how you answer the questions. If you respond that are the student's parents unwilling to provide their information, but the student doesn't have unusual circumstance that parents that prevents them from contact, uh, contacting or attain, attaining their parental information. It's going to ask yes or no. I read that horribly. I apologize. But if the student says that they're going to be able to provide it, then all is good. If a student puts they're not going to be able to provide parental information, then that's where the answer is going to be no, and then they will only qualify for the unsubsidized loan. It's going to eliminate them from Pell Grant if they qualified. It's going to eliminate from all that. So that's where you would have to take that additional step and contact the school to see and explain those circumstances. Um, I'm confused. Yes. So if you have a student whose parents are willing to provide their information, everything's cool. Yes. And you want to be considered for <coughs> subsidized or unsubsidized. You would be considered. So with that answer, I think it was that yes, you could provide it. Are the student's parents unwilling, 
Unwilly would be no. So yeah. So you'd put no as unwilly. That's what I thought. Sorry, I said that's that wrong. Thought. It's something new. <laughs> it's something new. I'm trying to get used to things too. <laughs> okay, so then here we are where the student then invites the parents to the FAFSA. <laughs> All right, so this is where your student is going to have to provide personal information about the parents to invite them to complete the parents' portion of the FAFSA. So this right here is important, and having the correct information is important, and having the correct email address so the parents will get it is important. So you want to make sure that your student has the information to be able to get sent over to the parents so that they can go ahead and sign and do their portion of the FAFSA. They're also going to be looking at the demographic information, citizenship status, parents' educational status, parents killed in the line of duty, and high school information. So that's some of the information that's going to be required to be added onto the FAFSA. Okay, thank you. Um, student financial information that it's going to look at is the tax returns. So if your student did file 2022 taxes, their information has to be put on the FAFSA. And again, it should be transferred automatically. All right. And they also need to put asset information if they have assets. Once the student section is completed, it's going to require that the student sign it. It's going to have the ability, as I stated, to put the college selections up to 20. It's going to review the information as far as have the student look through all the information they put through. And then it's going to require the signature in which they're utilizing their FSA ID. The Yes. The colleges, see, one comes across later after you did the initial application, can you add them on afterwards? You can. You can make a correction at any point to add any school on there. Okay, thanks. Or delete schools. <clears throat> yep. So some of the unusual circumstances, um, conditions that justify an institution making an adjustment to a student's dependency status. So again, if you answered yes to you have a parent that's unwilling, What's going to happen is that that student should contact the school immediately. Because what we will look for is look to see if the circumstances allows us to do what we call a dependency override. Okay. okay. So each school may have a different process on what that is. So if any student is in that situation, you want to contact each school that your student is interested in to figure out that process and make sure the correct documentation is sent to each school. Okay, so you could determine eligibility besides just the unsubsidized loan. This is when the parent then will receive the invitation. So the parent now receives the invitation because the student has went in. <coughs> They did their part, they signed it, they add their parents onto the FAFSA, now the parent is receiving the notification. It's an email invitation to complete parent portion of the student FAFSA, and parents must use the FSA ID to access the FAFSA. I have a question. I have a question. Oh, you go ahead. Um, yes. For me, when I went to college a long time ago, I had my own ID and information. So when I was doing it for my son, well, how would my way be my own ID from when I was in school? Okay, so I don't know how old you are, but when I was okay. All right, me too. Yeah. So when we were in school together, when we went to school, we used a pin number. Yeah. Okay. I don't know before early on when they switched to FSA ID, yeah. they let us use our PIN number to create the FSA ID. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they're doing that anymore. Okay. So you may have to go in, see if you, when you try to go ahead and create it, see if it says something about the PIN number. Okay. But I don't think it's letting you do it no more with the PIN number. It did a few, it did like, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago it was letting you do it. But I don't think it's letting you do that. Sure. 
Is this screen right here where it says get started for the parent, and the parent clicks that link, is that where you create the FSA ID, or should you have done that before that? You should have done it at that point. At the point before that. Before that. Okay. So at this point, your student has already went into the FAFSA and sent you an email, meaning that everyone at that point should have an FSA ID. Okay? And if you don't have one and you receive this, you need to make sure to go ahead and do it, and you have three days. You have to wait three days for that FSA ID to become active. Okay? The same thing in regards to the student information the parent's going to need as well. So the identity and contact information, the consent, meaning your FSA ID in order to transfer your tax information over, marital status, and then state of legal residence. Um, you need the tax filing status, the receipt of means tested federal benefits, it's going to ask you on the FAFSA, do you receive food stamps? Um, do you receive any benefit? Do you receive free lunch? I think those are some of the questions. So make sure you answer that correctly because it helps with that calculation. Um, tax filing status, meaning whether or not you did a 1040, 1040A. Do they still do the 1040A? Yes. So um, during the pandemic and, and following that, um, because the school qualified for everything, each one of us who had a child was sent was sent a card and given a question. So is that does that need to go in there? You know what? That's a great question. And, and you're and the first one to ask that. Are eligible for free school or for free lunch as well. So I mean, yep, every day. Those are online. Online. We will put yes. I would say. <laughs> You can answer it the way that you want to, but because you didn't apply specifically for it and go through the process through Job and Family Services, I would say that doesn't count. Um, and I think it's asking for this year, right now at this moment, are you receiving it? So I can't say that it would be wrong. I, I honestly don't think it's something that we have verified. Um, you want family size and number in college, tax return information, um, assets, and other parent information. For the family size, there was a, a few slides back where there's a difference between dependents and the family size, and how does that all work with this? I thought that was a future one. Did I pass it? Hold on one second. It, it was, don't go back. Okay. <laughs> We're going to go forward, though, because yeah. that is important. Okay. And it's, it's going to be top. Let me know if I don't answer okay. your question with this slide, and then we'll go from there. Did you? Um, before we get off the what parents enter, at the very beginning, and I've heard conflicting accounts on if retirement income should go on there. And so it depends. If you're pulling from retirement income, then it needs to be added. But if it's 40, like 401k and you're still building it and you're not pulling from it, then no, it does not need to go on there. If you're eligible to pull from it, but you don't. Then you still would not add it on there. Because they're counting it as income. If you're pulling it, you're counting it as income. Any idea uh, with the uh, loans against retirement? We're paying on a, on a loan, small loan against my retirement. Do you know if that, uh, that affects me one way or another? You know what, normally in that case, you would have had to put something on your taxes where it would be addressed, but it depends on the year that you did it. So if you did it in 21 and reported in 21, then it is what it is. Then 22, if it's not on there, then. Great. Thank you. Sure. And if a grandparent instead of a fund to pay, do you need to include the grandparent? No. You don't want to include the grandparent. Right. Yeah. No. Good question. Okay, so in regards to who is included in family size, so one of the things that have changed is they're carrying over the family size as far as who you claimed on your taxes. This is my understanding. I understand this is new for us too. So they are transferring over the information, the dependents that you have on your taxes. Okay. That does not mean that that number is accurate. Okay, so in this situation, let me see where we have it. 
So dependent filers include the student, parent, parents' dependent children, even if they live apart from the parent because of college enrollment. Okay, so you have another student in college, you still want to put them on the FAFSA. And then other people if they live with the parent. So if you are in a situation where you are supporting your parents now as parents and you have your parents within your households and you're supporting them, you can add them on to the FAFSA. If you are taking care of a niece or nephew within the household and you are supporting them, you want to include them on the FAFSA. As I stated, my understanding is that they are going to go ahead and transfer over that number from your taxes, but you need to look and update that information to make it match your true household. Okay, so double check that and make sure that the number is what it is. For independent filers include student and spouse if they're married, students dependent children, and other people if they live with the student. Okay? <coughs> And again, in order to determine if they should be counted in your household is if you're supporting at least 51% support. Yes? So this is going from our past uh, taxes, and we're talking about the future. So if in the meantime one of your dependents has rolled off, is that something that you would adjust? Correct. So, okay. Yes. So, I mean, some situations, as far as divorce situations, you may have a situation where um, it's, it's a legal agreement or maybe just an agreement that you guys have to where one person claims the student one year, other one claims the student the next year. That does not mean that the person that claimed them that year is the person that should be on the FAFSA. So you always have to ask yourself whether or not you supported, who supported that child, that student, that you're filling out the FAFSA for at least 51%. Did that answer your, your I think so. Somewhat. Okay, if you think about it and see, let me know. All right, then one parent, once parent section is completed, they're going to be review of the information and it's going to require the signature and submission of the FAFSA. In the FAFSA submission summary, it's going to include the eligibility overview. So on there, if you qualify for the Pell Grant, it should, it should say it on the FAFSA summary. The loans, excuse me, should say that as well. It's going to show you the answers that you um, put on there. It's going to show you school information. So the schools that you selected. I know in the prior FAFSAs, it, was going to, it had the graduation rates, the retention rates of the schools that your student listed on the FAFSA. So pay attention to that as well. And then it gives you the ability to print the summary. Once the FAFSA is completed, the student will receive an email. I do not know if the parent receives an email. The student will receive an email, and the college will receive the information as well. All right, so as long as that college is listed. So if for whatever reason you call a school and they say, no, we never got it, then first, make sure you get confirmation that it's submitted. Second, make sure you listed it, listed that school specifically. At any point, you can go in and make corrections. All right, when you are filling out the FAFSA before when we were able to input the tax information ourselves, we had students that put in, like if there was, um, let's say, 30,000 and 20 cents, people were putting the 20 cents, making it look like you made 300,000 something, okay? So you want to make sure you can go in and make a correction at any time. That's in adding a school, if you realize left out somebody in the household, you can make a correction, all right? At the point that you make a correction, though, you may want to call the college that your student is interested in, make sure they received the correction and that it was reviewed to see if it affects the award at all. Um, and that is online. You need your FSAID to do it. Yes. Student does the Student does the FAFSA. Both parents? Parents. Oh, Mrs. Carson does it, then he invites him and me. Yes. And we both do it. Yes, our understanding is that both of you guys have to put in your consent 
to be able to transfer the data over. That is our understanding. We've We've, so it won't double the information? It, it, it should not. It's just to give the consent that the information is, is um, that we're giving permission for it to be put on by both parents. That is our understanding. We've been back and forth with whether or not that is an accurate statement, and but we keep on going into webinars and we keep on saying that both parents have to consent. What I'm hoping is that everybody's wrong and one parent has to consent. <laughs> but we don't know. Our understanding is that both parents would have to give permission for that information to be transferred in, and it should not duplicate the income. Okay. okay. Um, the one thing I do want to touch on is special circumstances. So special circumstances are basically a situation where the FAFSA is not accurately being, um, the numbers on the FAFSA are not being reflected correctly. So because we're using 22 taxes, plenty of things could have changed within 23 and 24, okay? If a change of a job, if you lost employment, if um, it, it, anything, uh, medical expenses, um, maybe, 401k you pulled from at one point and you've utilized it and you haven't pulled from it again, but it's being calculated on the FAFSA. So there is the ability to tell the schools your special circumstance and allow us to look to see if we can update or if it's, if it's a situation where we would update the FAFSA to get a more accurate picture of what your SAI should be. Okay. We are actually looking at situation, and not to keep on bringing up divorce, I think I said it like 10 times already, but a divorce situation where it just recently happened to where you guys filed your taxes together. Okay, so what's gonna happen is, more than likely, it's going to transfer over the income information because you married, filed, joint. We're hoping that the system is in test. I don't know how the system is gonna be able to determine who made what. So this may be a situation where the income from both people were taken into consideration, but you have to contact the school and let them know that it, it's a divorce situation and that income should no longer be, be added on that FAFSA. And that's when we'll have to do the additional legwork to make sure that that is updated. So special circumstances different than unusual circumstances. Unique conditions exist that cannot be documented within the FAFSA. Students should contact Institutional's Financial Aid Office for more information after FAFSA has been submitted. So you want to submit the FAFSA first with the accurate information first, and then contact the school. Um, verification of FAFSA may be required, and then decisions are final and cannot be appealed to the U.S. Department of Education. So these special circumstances are not reported to the Department of Education. They're reported directly to the institution. And each institution may process it differently. So to where one school might say, okay, we could do this, and based on the documentation, we're able to adjust it to this. The other school may be like, no, we, we can't do that. We don't know where they got their numbers from, and, and it might be a different situation. So if you find that a school you benefited more from what you told them, find out how they did the calculation, what they took into consideration, and then bring it to the other school's attention to see if there's anything that school might have missed. So tips for success, start early and ask questions. So I'm proud of everybody that's here. I know you guys are waiting patiently for that FAFSA to come in. Um, know the importance of deadlines. I cannot stress enough, students. Look on your web, the website of the schools that you're interested in and write down those deadlines. Most of you have phones. Put it on your calendar of when things are due. It's going to be different for each school. God bless you. Read everything and do your research and make connections. Read everything, guys. I know a lot is coming at you. I know you're getting emails and mail and everything else. I know you are, but try to skim through it. Try to skim through it and determine what's important. You could be getting an, an email of a scholarship that's not on the website, 
And you might be saying, this just opened up. So pay attention to that. Don't assume you don't qualify. The biggest mistake is people thinking that they don't qualify. I know at John Carroll, you may not qualify for the federal Pell Grant, but you could qualify for an additional John Carroll Grant on top of that merit scholarship. Okay. Um, compare apples to apples. So make sure you have an understanding of each of the awards. Okay, and if for whatever reason you're not understanding the difference because each school is going to have a different award, it's going to be confusing. At any point, if you don't understand it, you want to make sure to bring it to our attention, one of the school's attention, so that we can try to break it down for you. And then involve the student. Okay, so make sure you're involving the student in this entire process so they know that this is an investment that they're you know, contributing to as well. Put my email address on here just in case you have any questions that you think about later. Um, regardless of coming to John Carroll or not, um, feel free to email me with any questions um, and I will try to answer it the best I can. Um, we're hoping to experience with this FAFSA the differences and next year probably be a little bit more um, informative um, but right now we really don't know we know as much as we can what's your title again i am the associate director of student financial services it's just financial services if you could eliminate the student just financial services i must set up so it's associate director of financial services any questions? I appreciate you guys being patient. Oh, yes. This is many, many slides ago and probably for next year. If a student has a work study, yes. when they do their um, when they do their part of the FAFSA for the next year, do they need to report that income or will it pull it in automatically? It should pull it in automatically if it's if it's taxable. Okay, thanks. Sure. All right guys, thank you. Oh I know she's Let's, since we're going to be doing it through the end of December, how much of an asset do they want reported by the kid? What if what if kid gets, you know, oh, we got a Christmas card from Grandma, and she put a hundred dollar check in there. It's That's a gift. The time that you're completing no. the FAFSA. <laughs> You do not report gifts to the government. They don't even know about that. Y'all college money, but y'all report that. You know, first. That's yours. Okay, you guys, I know you got a lot of good information. I promise I was not in your uh, law, okay? So this is just, can you guys hear me? Okay. The scholarship awareness. Um, so, this PowerPoint presentation will be on the CHEUA website in the senior page. And can we put Yes. We're going to put the financial aid um, information on the website as well. So I've been talking to the seniors since the end of August. And I'm always telling them to make sure that you plan your work, then work the plan. Because there's so many seniors who's like, I cannot find the scholarships. And you really do have to search for most of them. So you are worthy seniors uh, to do the work. Just make sure you reach your goal, OK? Um, I always tell the seniors that come in my office to try to do two scholarships a month. A week, truthfully, if they can. But if they can do two a month, um, that would be great. Um, I always tell them to research different databases. Um, I put scholarship information in Naviance for our seniors. Um, and also look at the college or university websites that you are planning to attend because they have information as well. So my overview is the type of scholarships, searching for scholarships, um, organization, which is really quick, the application process, and I want to talk about the Heights Community Scholarship Program and Heights Foundation Scholarships, and that's all. So there's different types of scholarships. The academic scholarships, most of them are coming from the colleges and universities that your students are applying to. So most of my seniors that have been coming to me that have been filling out 
college um, applications. They're coming to me, I got a scholarship, I got a scholarship. So most of them are getting some of the letters right now, um, yeah. which is great. Um, the interest scholarships is more like, I want to go to school for nursing, I want to go to school for psychology, right? So once the school knows what major you want to have, they might have different scholarships as well um, that you can apply for. The athletic scholarships, my football players, basketball players, volleyball players, swim. Um, if you're interested in doing that in college, make sure the college know because you can get scholarships for that too. I had students that got um, swim scholarships last year, track scholarships, <coughs> um, football, basketball, lacrosse. So just make sure you let the schools that you're interested in um, know that you want to do it on the collegiate level as well, okay? Clubs and um, hobbies. Clubs is we have a helping hands, which is a volunteer service here. That you know, if a school has volunteer scholarship money, that they can give it to them. Um, any community service base <coughs> um, is also another one. Um, National Honor Society is another one that gives out scholarships, and that's actually in Namiats now. So if anyone that is in an NHS. Please make sure you go into Naviance and look that information up, okay? That, that National Honor um, Scholarship is due at the beginning of December. So make sure you guys are checking Naviance. I try to tell y'all to check it and that's two, two times a week. If you have any questions, please come to my office. So other types of scholarships. Um, Scholarships with students that have disabilities. There's different um, state grants and scholarships that's going. There was one that was new last year for Ohio students. They got a grant. Most of all the students got a grant last year. Um, military scholarships, there are some. And our military do come to the school maybe, each branch maybe once a month to talk to students who are interested. So if there is a student who is interested <coughs> in the military, um, please let me know so I can get you directed to the right recruiter, if that's your choice. So now I'm telling the students to make sure that they beware of scams. So if you receive an email to say, hey, you are qualified for this scholarship and you could get $100,000 and you didn't apply for it, Make sure that it's reliable. Make sure that it is real. Don't give out your information, no any social security number, or anything else. Okay, credit cards. You do not have to give money. You do not have to give money for scholarships. If you want help finding scholarships, I'm here. Counselors are here, but you do not have to go to another. Um, place like an email that you get that can help you with the scholarships. Do not pay for the scholarships, okay? Can't say that enough. Like, I know one of our social workers, her student is getting those right now, so do not pay. And you said this PowerPoint is going to be, like, this is on CHU. It will be in a couple of days. I want to hope those other scam chips are, too. Okay. <laughs> and, and it does work, but my computer down there, so I didn't want to keep it like, <laughs> no, click no, on it. But it will be on there for you. And this is this is what exactly what it said. You've been selected as a finalist. Please come to like her say, come to Boston for nope. three days to learn nope. um, scholarship information and stuff. And it sounds great, right? Mm -hmm. But then you have to pay your way to get there. They might find you scholarships. You might have to pay to get the information. So just make sure you be aware, especially the no essay scholarships, put in your information, we'll get to you whenever, right? In a couple of weeks, you'll get information on the scholarship. Unless it's from a trusted site, not trusted. You're getting an email that looks fictitious. Don't trust it, okay? So like I said, some of the scholarships that I find um, like STEM-based scholarships, um, other different scholarships, like Coca-Cola was one of them, Dale <coughs> Scholars is another one. I usually put those on Naviance for the students, and I try to make an announcement. Make sure you check your uh, Naviance. I also put it in, in the peak of the week. So just make sure that 
you're checking your emails from me, come to my office to see if I have put any more new scholarships in that yet. Um, YouTube also has videos about scholarship searches if you're like really interested in learning more ways to do it. Um, the scholarship zone is actually my office, it's room 129, so if any seniors have any questions, especially on Wednesdays, because I opened up Wednesdays for their lunch period, that they can come to my office to get help with FSA IDs so that you won't have to do it on a Wednesday. Scholarship searches, and if you already have been accepted to a college or have scholarship information, I take that as well, because I need it for the senior database. So any seniors that's in here that needs help, please come to room 129. You can also, because most, but we tell all seniors to do common app to do your college applications, if the college that you're interested in is in common app. And then you can click on the financial aid resource tab mm -hmm. and get scholarship information from there as well. So Boston University will be put in their scholarship, I'm just putting out schools, information on their schools. So make sure that you check the colleges and universities that you're interested in um, because they're starting to update their scholarships. Bowling Green came, they will not have it until uh, December, January. And I think they're kind of waiting for FAFSA to open up. Ohio State has one at the top of their page. It's under cost and aid, and it will show you all the scholarships that they have for you that if you're applying to Ohio State University. At the bottom of the page, they also have search databases, um, like Going Mary, um, Scholarship 360, those are also on there too um, for students to look for scholarships. So like I said in Naviance, seniors you know this, you click on scholarship, there's a whole list of scholarships that I put on there for you guys. Um, and you can go under the National Scholarship Search in Naviance and they have like over like three million scholarships that you can look for. So when Ms. Loriana was talking about the deadlines, I put this on here because I tell the students to make sure they check Navion for Quest Bridge is a really good one that was in September for schools that have it. Coca-Cola ended theirs in October, which was really good. The Gates Scholarship, which was another big one, was September. But I will tell you that if you look at Navion, National Honor Society is due in December. There's a Martin Luther King essay contest. That's in January. I think that one is $1,500, if I'm not mistaken. The Jack Kent Cook Foundation Scholarship, that's a big one. And they will, theirs is open now. It will close in the beginning of January. Dale Scholarship, like the Dale Computers, theirs is December 1st. And the last one, National Honor Society. November 30th. So make sure you guys are checking Naviance to get those that scholarship information. So no more Coca-Cola, but Common App. Once you sign into your account, you're going to select that financial aid resource tab and get the information um, for there. Okay. Here's some other good ones, scholarship360.org um, is very uh, well organized. It asks you information about your major, uh, what schools are you looking at, what's your current GPA. They might ask household information, nothing too um, intrusive. And almost once a week, you'll get an email. Here are the scholarships that we found that you apply for, okay? Another good one is goingmary.com. I love Going Mary. Um, I played around with it before. Um, it arranged the scholarships by the deadline. And truthfully, I just played on it. I got, and I still get an email every day of different scholarships that students can apply for. You can even put Cleveland Heights as your high school. And since I'm already on there as a counselor, I will get 
a notification that says Samantha Walker or whoever um, filled out a college application, I'm sorry, a college scholarship, please make sure that she turns in all the materials, okay? So Boy Mary is a very good one. You can also look at Google, but I mean, you're gonna find, you know, some things that are good and some that are not. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So college board, you guys are always on there for SAT, ACT. They also have the Opportunity Scholarship Program that you can look for scholarships on there. Um, Discover the credit card. I know it's a credit card, but they do have scholarships as well. Um, Sally May also has scholarship information as well. Um, Raise Me. Raise Me is a really good one for seniors. It's going to ask you, just like the other um, databases, but it's going to ask you your GPA, it's going to ask you community service, any sports that you're in, and they take all of that, and then they will find money for you. I actually know some students that got scholarships for Raise Me. It goes with 330 colleges. So make sure, seniors, that you are doing the Raise Me so you can get scholarship money. College Now. So we do have College Now in the building. They're on the second floor across the hall from your, um, your principal's office, the senior office, class office. They have a database as well, but if you do not want to look on their database, they are happy for you to come in your office and they can help you with the scholarship. They do have a scholarship, two scholarships that's coming out in January. One is for the Cleveland Browns, Motley, I think his last name is. Um, he has a scholarship, and then there's another scholarship that College Now is doing it. But they won't have their information available until January. Heights Community Scholarships. I know this is a big one for our seniors. So there's Heights Community Scholarships where um, there are different alum that, um, different businesses within the community that um, have money that they want to, you know, help the kids with scholarship. One of them is uh, Parker Hannafin, if anyone who, who is interested in STEM related, um, that is a $1,500 scholarship. And you seniors, you guys will get that information in early December. I will have a Google Classroom with all of the scholarships on there. There's also the Heights Foundation, and they have additional scholarships um, from alum, from different businesses, um, and other places as well. So they have a little bit more than the Heights community. Their scholarship will be on my Google Classroom. So you'll fill out the general application that's going to be in Google Classroom, and then you're going to get access to all of the scholarships, community scholarships, and foundation. I would just tell you guys to just make sure that you read the criteria for each scholarship because you do not want to fill out information for a hockey scholarship and you don't play <laughs> hockey, right? So make sure that you look at all the criteria. There are some that has uh, GPAs that is required, 2.5, 2.7. There are some that is no um, GPA required, okay? So make sure you take advantage of that and make sure you listen to the deadline that I give you. Because the deadline this year will be strict. It'll probably be in the beginning of February with all information. So that's giving you two months, hopefully, to get that information in, okay? Staying organized. So one thing that we were talking about with the financial aid is make sure that you have a, um, a good email address. So you want to make sure that you make an email address for all your colleges, your financial aid information, um, make sure it's a professional email. Mm -hmm. um, no slang, no nicknames on there. But make sure you make a professional email address. It's something that you're gonna remember, right? Um, make a list of every scholarship that you meet criteria. So that pink piece of paper that was in the back, 
that is for it has what's the deadline, what scholarship, do you, you know, did you read the criteria? So all of that, you can use that pink piece of paper to keep yourself, um, keep yourself on track. Make sure, the biggest thing is make sure it's for FAFSA and scholarship that you read and go over that deadline. You do not want to miss a scholarship by a day because you just forgot about it and didn't know the deadline. Make sure you guys look at the deadline for each um, scholarship. Set a monthly goal. And I always tell the students, if your parent is involved um, with your college um, application process, maybe set a goal like with mom and dad, you know, on a Sunday afternoon, maybe one hour, look over some databases, try to go over some scholarships if you can. I know everyone is busy, but one hour a week shouldn't be so bad. Make sure you keep on track of everything that you know you're applying for. Make sure that you have um, your essays together. Make sure it's on a flash drive or on your computer. Um, if you need help with essays, you can also come in my office. Lake Erie Inc. is also doing um, scholarship um, workshops and they're trying to come back here within the next month to help seniors in the afternoon um, with another workshop. Okay? So that's just the pink sheet that I gave you guys. The application uh, process, we already talked about that. If you have any questions, make sure that you contact the college or the university. Um, make sure that you do it for the scholarships as well. If you have any questions, sometimes they have an email address or phone number that you can contact to see if you qualify for it or if you have any additional questions. Um, everything, your, all your strengths should be in that. So if they ask you about yourself, make sure you put everything that you can on there. If you're on National Honor Society, make sure you let them know. If you do community service, make sure you let them know. Highlight your strengths. Don't be afraid to brag about yourself. That's right. So we have a brag sheet that we use for like our national marriage. But make sure you put it down and then ask your teachers or ask your parents because there might be something. No one likes to. Well, some people do, but <laughs> you know. If you don't like bragging on yourself, just think about all of the positive things that you've been doing. Write it down and then show it to your parents. They might say, did you forget that you, you know, yeah, did the community you service in the community mm -hmm. last year? Put that on there, yeah. you know. Make sure you brag on yourself. You want that extra money. I want you to get the money. <laughs> Make sure when you do your essay, just, you know, research the audience. Um, one of my students is... Well, who graduated last year went to Kent and they said, talk about yourself. And I'm like, don't put, you know, my name is Samantha, I'm a senior. Like, put that pop thing in there. She put, I am an artist. And, you know, when I was little, I cut up fabric and got in trouble because I wanted to make clothing for my Barbies. She's in the fashion, pro fashion program now. So I think it's wonderful. So make sure that you express yourself, make sure that they know about you, that they'll be like, wow, I really want Randy, wow, I really want this to me in my school. Draw attention to yourself, okay? Make sure you check your grammar. If you need somebody to check it, your English teachers are more happy to read all your things and give you uh, feedback as well. Letters of recommendation. So, some of the scholarships are going to ask for letters of recommendation. Colleges also ask for letters of recommendation. So make sure that if you're asking a teacher, a pastor, anyone for a letter of recommendation, that you give them a couple of weeks so that if something goes on, um, if they're having, um, if they don't have time, then you can find somebody else. So make sure two to three weeks. Hey, Ms. Narduzzi, um, I need a letter of recommendation for this scholarship or this college. Can you write the letter? And they say, sure. And then you give them that, you know, it's due at this day. When can I um, get it or can you email it? Okay, so make sure you give them notice. And please, seniors, 
when you're asking for these um, letters of recommendation, write them a thank you letter, okay? Mm -hmm. Especially with the scholarships. They love getting thank you letters from um, seniors all the time. Um, like I said, more tips for us, apply for qualified scholarships. Make sure you qualify for it. Make sure you look at the DMI. Um, and don't neglect the small or local scholarships. The Kites Community and Heights Foundation gave um, money away where there were students that had twenty-five dollars to $30,000 working out that night. So make sure that you guys apply for those scholarships. We already talked about FAFSA, so I don't really want to go over it anymore. Um, you're going to go to student aid. I know you said if you put in FAFSA, it'll just, uh, go today. It opens December 2023. We do not have the date. And you're going to apply each year, okay? CSS profile. Make sure that each school, I know, I think Case does the CSS profile. Um, that one you do have to have tax information um, handy. Um, it is a tedious, tedious process. Um, I did one with a student today. It took a couple of hours. So, um, but this is going to help you find more money. So FAFSA and CSS profile. But it's free for you if you make less than $100,000 a year as a family, okay? Here's some of the information that I use. And like I said, this will be on the web, CHUH website. So you don't have to write anything down. Remember seniors, you need help with scholarships, college information. Please, please, please come see me sooner than later, okay? I'm here to help everyone out. Yep. Does anyone have any questions? I know I went fast, but I really don't want to keep you here too long tonight. Well, if there's not any questions, I just want to say thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Um, have a wonderful evening. Seniors, parents, if you have any questions, seniors come to my office. Parents, you can always call or email me. Have a great night.